Hello fellow armchair astronauts and welcome to part 4 in our series on rocket engines. In several of my other videos I've mentioned how rocket engines are extremely hot. Hot enough to not just melt, but sometimes even boil certain types of metal. So in this video we're going to be discussing the cooling techniques used to keep rocket engines in one solid piece. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Lift off. Lift off. Lift off. We have a lift off. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift off on Apollo 11. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hot head. Nice to be in orbit. Rocket engines are subject to ridiculously high temperatures. Without cooling, most high-powered rocket engines would melt within seconds of starting up. So engineers must find ways to keep the temperatures down. This is most important for the combustion chamber and the nozzle, since that's where almost all of the heat in most engines is created. The simplest way to keep an engine cool is to only turn it on for short periods of time. If the engine is only turned on in short bursts, it won't reach high enough temperatures to fail. Of course, this means in between firings there must be enough time for the engine to cool back down. Now, obviously there are a few problems here. Only turning the engine on for a few seconds at a time isn't really an option in most cases. In many practical applications, a rocket engine is required to burn continuously for at least a few minutes. So this technique is usually only used for control thrusters on spacecraft. Another way to passively cool engines is to use ablative materials. An ablative material burns away as it gets hotter, but they don't melt or deform. Making components from ablative materials is often easier and cheaper than using other forms of cooling, but they also tend to be quite a bit heavier. Another downside of ablative cooling is if you want the engine to burn for a longer period of time, you must increase the amount of ablative material, which adds even more weight. This also makes ablative cooling a poor choice for reusable engines, since they would need to be taken apart and have all their ablative components replaced after every flight. Ablative cooling isn't that popular on liquid engines, but is very common on solid rocket motors. This is because solid rocket motors are typically used as boosters or first stages, where the extra weight isn't that big of a deal and because liquid engines have the ability to use some other methods of cooling which don't require as much added weight. The most common method of cooling liquid engines is regenerative cooling. Regenerative cooling takes advantage of the fact that one of the most effective ways to cool something down is to pass a fluid over it, and liquid engines already have a lot of fluid flowing through them. Regeneratively cooled engines take the fuel and pump it through small channels around the outside of the combustion chamber and the nozzle. The heat is transferred to the fuel, which then flows back into the combustion chamber. This means the temperatures inside the combustion chamber are a little higher. In our last video, we learned that heat in the combustion chamber contributes to exhaust velocity, so by recapturing this heat and putting it back into the combustion chamber, we can increase the efficiency of the engine, because we're no longer throwing that heat away. And because there is a continuous flow of cool fuel from the tanks, the walls of the combustion chamber never reach high enough temperatures to actually cause a failure, no matter how long the engine is fired for. Regenerative cooling is extremely effective, and just about every liquid rocket engine uses it. The final types of cooling we're going to talk about are film cooling and curtain cooling. I'm going to lump these two into kind of the same category because they're pretty similar. Film cooling is where the exhaust from the turbo pumps is piped in around the outside of the engine bell in such a way that it creates a thin boundary layer insulating the walls from the much hotter gases from the combustion chamber. The exhaust from the turbo pumps is pretty cool since most of the heat energy was used up to spin the pumps. Curtain cooling uses clever design of the injector to keep extra fuel around the walls of the combustion chamber. This fuel creates a boundary layer to insulate the walls just like film cooling does. And it's okay to have extra fuel around the walls because most engines run fuel rich to begin with. These two methods of cooling are great because they add almost no extra weight to the engine. There are some downsides however. For film cooling, the engine must be an open cycle pump fed engine since closed cycle engines don't have any turbine exhaust. And with both film cooling and curtain cooling, they're often not enough to keep the engine cool and must be used in combination with another form of cooling. In fact, most real engines use several forms of cooling. For example, the F1 rocket engine used regenerative cooling for the combustion chamber and the converging and throat sections of the nozzle, and film cooling was used for the diverging section of the nozzle. And the RS-68 engine uses regenerative cooling for the combustion chamber, but uses ablative for the nozzle. When designing the cooling systems for a rocket, engineers typically try to get the lowest weight and cost while still keeping the engine within a safe temperature range. In the next episode, we're going to be talking about combustion cycles. This has been Liam from Space is Kinda Cool. Thanks for watching.
to both side boosters on touchdown. Lady Alfred is moving on to a running back. Hold on, look who we're running with. Going to Anthony Pesce. Coming up very shortly, the center will be attempting its landing on the autonomous spaceport drone.